Dr. Thierry Klein, uh, Nokia Bell Labs, uh, thank you very much for joining us on Australia in Space TV here in New Delhi at the India Space Congress. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Uh, look, you, you gave the opening plenary yesterday uh, here and uh, talking about the, the Nokia 4G network uh, that's been established on the moon. Uh, particularly, what a shame on IM2, uh, it didn't quite work, but you have tested and uh, confirmed that the network works. Um, maybe talk us about IM2 mission, uh, what went well and what didn't quite uh, go to plan. Uh, and then we'll talk about the 4G sort of aspects and particularly also the um, uh, what can be happening back on Earth as well. Yeah. So absolutely. Um, for us, the, the IM2 mission was really a technology demonstration mission. Uh, to, to validate that we can take cellular uh, technologies that we use every day on Earth, that you and I use every day, yeah. that we can take those same standards-based technologies but adapt them for uh, operation on the Moon and ultimately to support any government, any commercial missions that go to the lunar surface. So, uh, IM2 was really the demonstration mission for us. We reconceptualized what a cellular network looks like. Uh, at the heart, it is still a cellular network, and that your phone, my phone, yeah. uh, use the same technology. But then, of course, we had to build it in a swap-optimized form factor. Uh, I think it's the most compact network you could find right now. Yeah, it's a pack of size of car, uh, a pack yeah. of cards. Is it? Well, we have we have a few components. There is the the equivalent of your smartphone, which is about the size of a deck of cards. It yeah. doesn't have a screen or a, or yeah. a keyboard. That uh, was integrated into a uh, Luna Outpost rover and an Intuitive Machines hopper. And then the network part, which is really the crux of what we're focusing on, is uh, we call the network in a box, and that's about the size of a pizza box. Uh, hardened for space from a thermal perspective, from a mechanical perspective, some radiation hardening, and it's your, 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 your integrated network in a, in a very, very small form factor. So that was mounted on the IM2 lander. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, the the IM2 lander tipped over uh, at landing uh, was sideways in a crater, so that created some issues for the mission in terms of availability of power. Uh, but nevertheless, we consider it a success from a, from a Nokia Bell Labs perspective. We managed to turn our network on. We were supplied power for about 25 minutes, and uh, during the time that we were uh, supplied power, we could turn the network on. We had a fully operational cellular network. We could issue telecommands to the network. We got telemetry data back from the network, so we uh, were confident we had an operational network on the lunar surface just for a very short period of time. Well, we talk about the 4G network that we see here uh, in the terrestrial environment. How much, uh, I think the project you mentioned was 2018 uh, you started this project. How much sort of ad adaptation was there required? Obviously the radiation uh, in space, but uh, was there, was there a, a giant leap there in terms of advancements there or yeah. just some moder modernization and adaptability to the, to the environment? So I'd say there's really three main engineering challenges we faced. Uh, at the heart it is the cellular network, it builds on the Nokia network, a Nokia product. Um, but the engineering challenges were really one, optimizing the size, weight and power. So we have massive integration from a hardware and software perspective. Even though it's all the functionalities you find in the cellular network, we massively integrated the, uh, the form factor. So that's the first one. The second one is around environmental hardening. It has to survive yeah. launch. It has to survive transit to the moon. It has to survive landing on the moon. So a lot of the mechanical stresses on the equipment from a shock, vibration, acceleration perspective, thermal, as well as radiation. So that's a, a lot of the engineering challenges around the mechanical and the environment that you operate the network in. Not so much the communication aspect itself, but the mechanical yeah. environment. Uh, and then the third one is, it's a fully autonomous network. The IM2 mission is a robotic mission. There are no astronauts in it. But even if you think of a mission with astronauts, they have um, a lot of things that they're doing. Being a telecom technician is not their job. So this network has to be completely self-deploying, self-operating, self-healing, self-configuring. So a lot of uh, engineering went into making this network autonomous. Hey, what's your background? Uh, were you, are, are you on the comm side or are you a space person? I suppose the, the learning uh, at Nokia here with this mission from NASA uh, is to go, wow, this is a really great challenge. Uh, I'm just thinking, what, what was the learning curve for you? Uh, and maybe the makeup of the team, how, how big and sort of the skill sets there? So uh, my my background, my day job, I'm a, I'm a networking researcher. You're a network guy? I lead the, the research at uh, Nokia Bell Labs. But my, my technical background is engineering, networking, communication. Uh, outside of work, I'm a space geek. Okay, so there you go. This is the perfect <laughs> project to marry hobby and nice. professional. 
Um, I think we learned a lot over the last seven, eight years on the space industry. I think everybody on the team is, is passionate about space, supporting space exploration, but really coming from the telecom networking yeah. uh, side, but then learning as much as we can about uh, space and the particular requirements and constraints you face. Well, one of the questions was uh, why 4G? Uh, it was a timing issue there, but yeah, 5G, 6G into the future. Uh, maybe just talk us through uh, where that's at. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we picked 4G because when, when we started this project with NASA in uh, 2020, that was still, uh, 5G was very nascent. Uh, and the main point for us was demonstrate cellular technologies. The big leap for the space industry is going from UHF, VHF, proprietary communication technologies to a standard space cellular technology. That's the big leap. Yeah. Going from 4G to 5G is a relatively small step at that point. And 4G had plenty of capacity, performance, coverage that we needed for the IM2 mission. So it is the mature technology at the time when we started the project. It supports all the requirements of the mission. And, and really the big leap is going to a cellular technology. Yeah. And um, we, we definitely will upgrade the system going to 5G. We also believe that the space industry should probably be one generation behind okay. uh, what you would find on terrestrial networks so that there is the maturity from the ecosystem, from the device perspective, yes. from the technology perspective. So when, by the end of this decade, when we go to 6G on, uh, say, by, the tw by 2030 on terrestrial networks, that's probably the right time frame to go to 5G for space. And the form factor, is that could that get smaller, lighter, less power, those kind of things? Um, yeah, we probably expect that it to be very similar form factor, more capabilities if we go to 5G. Yeah. Um, but the form factor in terms of size, weight, power, we always look to optimize it, but uh, it is already pretty compact. Right, right now. nice. Uh, and maybe talk to Axiom Spacesuit as well. Uh, we've had Axiom Space on Australia and Space TV. Uh, but yeah, uh, where are you at with the spacesuit? Yeah, the, the other exciting mission we announced about a year ago is that we're working with Axiom Space and, and NASA to integrate cellular technology into the uh, AXEMU spacesuit, which is the next generation spacesuit that Axiom is building. And we'll demonstrate cellular technology with Axiom in the Artemis 3 mission which is quite a historic mission, yeah, well, not because we're part of it, but because it will be the first mission that astronauts will be landing back on the, on the lunar surface. So bringing the same cellular technology that we have on the IM-2 mission, bringing that into the suits, adding voice capabilities to it, and uh, being able to send biometric data from the astronauts' voice between the astronauts and with mission control, but also high-definition video from helmet-mounted cameras. Wonderful. So uh, it's that'll be, be exciting to see. Yeah, absolutely, see an astronaut with like, people will finally believe that man's on the moon, <laughs> people are on the moon. Uh, maybe the terrestrial applications back, uh, the learning uh, that, that's happened, uh, you know, mining, agriculture and those kind of applications as well. Uh, anything learnt that you're bringing back uh, or the, the improvements to what you've already got here yeah. from that learning? Yeah, it's an interesting story because we go from Earth to Moon uh, and we start with cellular technologies on Earth and then we adapt them and reconceptualize them yeah. from the moon. But then we need to solve these engineering challenges. And we think a lot of those can also be brought back to Earth. I talked about optimizing the size, weight, power, um, making this network completely autonomous. Those are attributes that are very important for terrestrial applications as well. If you think about a mine or an offshore oil rig or remote wind farm, being able to cover those environments in a in an, uh, with a cellular network that's optimized, that you can deploy very quickly, completely autonomously operating it. Uh, those attributes that are very important for some of these uh, harsh industrial environments. Yeah. And, and any advances we make for space will be beneficial for terrestrial applications as well. And I think in terms of a life cycle, that, uh, as uh, space being one behind, you learn that and then apply that back for the next, ne next uh, network. Uh, and the like, and that life cycle. Uh, maybe a final question is, what is the life cycle or the span uh, for the network? Uh, what's, uh, does it survive? How long does it survive uh, there before equipment needs to be upgraded or replaced? Yeah, so, uh, so that really depends how this evolves for future missions and say permanent presence on the lunar surface. The IM-2 mission was designed for one lunar day, so about 12, <laughs> okay. 12 Earth days. Right. Uh, so we didn't have capabilities to survive lunar night, Not, neither did any of the other mission partners. Got so it. it was a very short mission duration. Ultimately, when we think about a network that's permanently deployed on, on the surface, to support an, an operating economy. Of course, we need to survive in night, and there's there's additional challenges from, from that perspective. Nice. And, and that's where 
you know, we still need to learn quite a bit on how to do that. Well, you mentioned it was autonomous, but no doubt uh, in the future, some network technicians uh, will have to go up there and uh, fix the network. Uh, but look, Dr. Thierry Klein uh, from the Nokia Bell Labs, a pleasure to finally meet you. I've followed this, uh, this story for some period of time, so it's great to have you on Australia and Space TV and enjoy the rest of the Indian Space Congress. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Appreciate it.